We have an action-packed lineup today. We have a state senator talking about Obamacare in South Dakota. We'll hear from Gary Coe on Psalm 91. Randazzo rants about sissies in Congress. We'll have a health care lesson from Dr. Laura and a review of the news with Gordon and Ed. Stick around. It's going to be a great show. Bruce Rampelberg is with me, state senator from District 30 in South Dakota. Bruce, later this month, there's going to be an Obamacare debate in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And the debate is going to be focused on what in the world is South Dakota doing embracing Obamacare? And uh, you and I have talked a lot about this issue. And uh, there were two Senate bills, the governor's bills, Senate Bill 38 and 43, that many say ushered in Obamacare in South Dakota. Tell me why you supported those and would you still? Yeah, well, at the time that we voted on those, and I did vote for both of those, it was my understanding that the way Obamacare was written, and I still believe this is true today, the feds would come in and they would set up this program, this exchange, where different insurance companies would all come together at one point and you could <clears throat> choose between them. And I wanted to make sure that South Dakota ran that, not the feds, for a couple of reasons. One is I don't think the feds are capable of running it like South Dakotans will, but number two, I also believe that they would use that as an excuse to increase the eligibility rules for our Medicaid. And right now, the Obamacare would increase that to, we would have, we have 115,000 people right now on Medicaid. 70,000 of those are kids. The way that Obamacare is written, it will increase that by 50,000 more people. It will cost us $100 million a year to serve those people that will become eligible for Medicaid under Obamacare. Those are great talking points. But now let me tell you about some reality that you might not have known. Uh, you, I bet you didn't know at the time. Many of us didn't. Uh, we were fed the line that South Dakota had to set up their own exchange or the federal government would come in and do it for us. That's still That's, true. Well, uh, I did some research on that. And I have in my possession, I'll show it to you, a copy of the application our governor made uh, for first million dollars and the second 5.8 million dollars. You know what it says? That the federal government will allow a state to establish their own health care exchange. Sounds good, doesn't it? But then you read on, the, the states that set up their own health care exchange have to comply with every single rule, regulation, and policy as if the federal government did it. So what we really accomplished we were, we were fed a line, and what we accomplished was we did for the federal government what they were going to do anyway. Well, that, that, that's possibly true. But, but well, it's, it's in the application. Yeah, and I'm not arguing that at all. But I really believe, though, that we're better off having South Dakotans run that than we are having government, government employees. Well, let me ask you the question. If we have to comply with all the rules, regulations, and every jot and tittle of Obamacare, how are we better off? Well, th that's another good point. But I think we're always better off when we control it rather than somebody out of, out of wherever. DC. Well, but see, the feds well, control it if they write right. the rules. But, but let me go on. And I, I understand that. But even though they write the rules, the way you apply the rules... There's some flexibility there that you wouldn't have if the feds wrote, uh, uh, applied the rules. If we apply the rules, we can use some judgment from time to time. If they apply the rules, we may not. But here's the point I want to make. Okay. When the Supreme Court came out with their ruling, one of the things that they said in there is that states do not have to follow the federal mandates for Medicaid. Now, that's in the rules that we would have to follow. But if they set up this uh, exchange and the feds run it, they will put that in there. Here's another quick question. Our governor tells us that we're not setting up a health care exchange, that we're waiting. Why then do we have to have a full-time staff of three and a part-time staff of three working on a health care exchange today as we talk? The things that I read indicate that there's a timing issue here. Because when the drop dead day comes, we're not going to have time to get ready to put this in place. That's it's very a terrible, complex. terrible well, thing. A drop dead date. <laughs> yeah, yes, it is. <laughs> That's a. That, let me let me retract that. <laughs> the sender asked to retract. You know, anyway, um, but the point is, these programs are very complex. 
There's a lot of, of paperwork, a lot of information, a lot yes, of things. Yes, it's that about that yeah, complex, yeah. isn't it? Like 2,600 pages that nobody really understands. Yes. We have to spend time with people who are knowledgeable now to prepare for that. And some states, in fact, are so far behind, they will not be able to pass muster. Other states are just saying no. Yeah, but that's not going to work. Well, the, it's working the, so far. The Supreme Court <laughs> said that they cannot say no. Well, uh, we're out of time, but. Uh, we'll have to talk more about that because uh, Bobby Jindal and uh, the governor of Texas and many others are saying no, and the Supreme Court hasn't locked them up yet. So I know. we'll talk more. And stay tuned. Yeah. <laughs>